I've encountered a lot of people who have this idea that um, that originally Hebrew didn't have vowels. And I've even talked to people who say, well, we read the ancient Hebrew, there is no vowels. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure every spoken language has vowels in it. <laughs> I'm here with Dr. Nick Posgay of Cambridge University. It's great to be here with you, Nick. You just had this amazing lecture that you presented at the Society of Biblical Literature Conference. We're here in November of 2021, and it was absolutely fascinating about the history of um, the Hebrew vowel system and, and particularly the graphic symbols. And you have a book coming out. Tell us about the book. The book is a. Uh, you tell us about the book. Right. Yeah, the the book is uh, called Points of Contact, and it's about comparing linguistic traditions in the medieval period to the Masoretes. The Hebrew Masoretes are one of those, but also mm -hmm. Arabic and Syriac grammatical traditions, mm -hmm. and finding relationships and similarities between them, uh, often technical terminology that was shared or mm -hmm. ideas that were shared, um, as all three traditions figured out different ways to study and record vocalization in mm -hmm. the Bible and the Quran. You had this great example in your, in your lecture where you, you took Sadia Gaon, who was a 10th century uh, rabbinical leader, and in his discussion of the Hebrew vowels, he uses terms from an Arabic grammar of vowel, talking about vowels, and you suggested he probably actually read that grammar. Yeah. So tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's hard to know for sure exactly what people read um, mm -hmm. and what they used to um, sort of educate themselves and to grow up in a medieval system of education. Now, mm -hmm. in Saadia's time, he was yeah. born in the late 9th century in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Formal education, a lot of it took place in Arabic, so the Arabic pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, and Saadia probably grew up speaking Arabic and was well-versed in classical Arabic. And we can kind of tell this because he translated the Pentateuch and he translated it from mm -hmm. Hebrew into Arabic and his Arabic is very good. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very similar to classical Arabic. So... And in fact, the Christians in the Middle East, if I'm not mistaken, use Saadia's, who was a Jew, yeah. they use his Arabic translation of the Old Testament of the Tanakh to this very day. Some do, yeah. yeah, yeah which is incredible. It's that, very yeah. good. So apparently he was an expert at Arabic, which he spoke fluently, and he's using Arabic terms to describe Hebrew vowels. Yeah. And so your book is uh, looking at the, the Hebrew vowel system, the Arabic vowel system and the Syriac vowel right. system, right? And the and the points of I guess the points of contact. Yeah, yeah. and that's a pun because they're because they're dots, points. Yeah. In Hebrew, we call it nikud or nikudot, which are dots. So, um, you know, a lot of people in my audience they they've heard about the Bible and Hebrew, and they have. I've encountered a lot of people who have this idea that um, that originally Hebrew didn't have vowels, and I've even talked to people who say, well, we read the ancient Hebrew, there is no vowels. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure every spoken language has vowels in it. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're coming at this as an academic who studied these different cultures and different languages, and really you're a linguist, if, if I'm, if, would linguist that be fair to say? Linguist and historian. Okay. It's both. Um, okay, so, so talk to me about um, what did Hebrew have before the vowels were written down? Um, Hebrew before the vowels were written down is more or less... Hebrew that we know it, biblical Hebrew okay. that once the vowels are written down uh, is recording essentially the Hebrew that was spoken before. So when we yeah. say that there were no vowels, when people say that, they really mean that there were no vowel points because those weren't invented until the medieval period. Okay. And the consonants, the consonants of the Bible were written a thousand years before that. Well, let's start with this term that you threw out, Masoretes. Right. Who were the Masoretes? Well, the Masoretes were a group or several groups of scholars in the medieval period, mostly between the 8th and 10th and into the 11th centuries, mm -hmm. who sat down and figured out how to record the spoken tradition of Biblical Hebrew, how they were pronouncing Biblical Hebrew when they read it in synagogue. Mm -hmm. Because before that time, there were no dots. So you would see the consonantal text, but you would read the vocalization from memory, because presumably the person reading would know the text. Mm -hmm. So the Masoretes invented a system to record the vowels that were already spoken and right. transmitted, right? Exactly. I mean, they didn't, they didn't invent the vowels, or did they? Did they invent no, vowels? No, no. Okay. No, the vowels are already there, and they were part of a tradition that goes back centuries of mm -hmm. how to pronounce the vowels in each of those words. It's just nobody had written them down. And that's a really important point, 
So uh, one of the ideas I've, I've heard discussed in literature is, um, or read about in literature, is that um, it's not that there was a, a way to pronounce a certain word, but sometimes there was a way to pronounce a certain word in a specific verse, and that same word in a different book, you know, the example that, that someone once brought to me is the, he, the Hebrew word for the certain type of stone, which is barkat. And in Exodus, it's, I forget which one it is, in Exodus it's barkat, and the other one is bareket. And, and it's consistent throughout the manuscripts that in Exodus it has one vocalization, and in Ezekiel I think it is the other vocalization. And so it seems like there were these, I mean, the, the way it's usually explained is there are these professional readers, yeah. and they memorize the reading of um, every word, uh, or you know, the entire passages, of course. Um, and, that, and so what the Master Reads did is they wrote down what had already been uh, preserved and, and transmitted orally, is essentially what you're saying. Yeah. And some of these inconsistencies that you're pointing out, like mm -hmm. one, one word may be different, pronounced differently mm -hmm. in one uh, book from another book, mm -hmm. these are, can be clues that what the Tiberian Masoretes were recording was actually a very ancient system because okay. they had these inconsistencies, but mm -hmm. they were already ingrained. Mm -hmm. you know, so they thought, this is tradition, we have to preserve How it. How ancient? There is evidence that some aspects of the Tiberian tradition mm -hmm. are preserving features of Second Temple Hebrew. Okay. And we can find some of this, uh, like we just saw this uh, mm -hmm. through Greek transcriptions of mm -hmm. Hebrew from the first and second century CE. Mm -hmm. They preserve features of uh, Hebrew that uh, we see in the later Tiberian tradition. Um, so there are some aspects, scholars debate how much of the tradition is exactly preserved, but it seems like they were following an ancient tradition that they knew very well and were concerned with recording it properly. So when we open up a Hebrew Bible today, if you go online and you see a Bible and you see the vowel points, those are Tiberian points. Those are Tiberian points. So the Tiberian system, at least the dots that we see in a Bible today, mm -hmm. when you open up your Bible, um, are not really attested before the 8th or 9th century in manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So we know that they were invented around that time. There are earlier manuscripts that have what's called the Palestinian or Land of Israel tradition, um, and it is a different set of points. Um, and instead of what we know, there's vowel points above and below. These were all placed above, mm -hmm. um, above the line of Hebrew text. Uh, and there's some indications that it's related to Syriac pointing, but it's not totally firm, uh, the connections, because it's very little manuscript evidence mm -hmm. and evidence of you know, how would that have happened? Um, it's hard to can, tell. Can I point out a methodological problem here? Yeah. So we don't really have manuscripts of, we certainly don't have codexes from before the 8th century. Um, I don't even know if we have from the 8th century. We definitely have 9th century codices. Um, so we don't know for sure, I, I'm suggesting and you can disagree with me, we don't know for sure exactly when they were written down because we don't have evidence one way or another. In other words, it's not like we have this naked codex from the 6th century we have scrolls, but scrolls never had accents or vowels, so I mean, with some few exceptions. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, that is a good point. Um, you know, if it's, if it's not in the so, so then what would make you think it is from, let's say, the 8th century? Um, the Tiberian, you mean? Yeah, the Tiberian, yeah. Um, well, as I talked about today in the lecture, I think there is a definite uh, connection between the perception of vowels um, mm -hmm. and where they're pronounced inside the mouth. So the back of the mouth is considered high, the front of the mouth is considered low. And this was mm -hmm. how Masoretes described vowel phonology, mm -hmm. um, because if it's not written down, you have to find a way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. right? um, and that idea, as I mentioned, is probably comes from the Syriac grammatical tradition, uh, mm -hmm. which was active in the seventh century using similar mm -hmm. terminology okay. and similar descriptions. And they did have dots um, prior to the 8th century. They had a diacritic okay. dot that is first attested uh, in the 4th or 5th century, probably. Okay. Now, uh, this is not a, wow. a vowel dot, exactly, but it evolved into the vowel dot. Let's talk about, you said a diacritic dot. Explain yeah. for the audience who may not be right. linguist so what, in, what diacritics it, are. Uh, so it's a, a, a little dot that indicates something about mm -hmm. how you should pronounce a certain word. So you mm -hmm. place it above a word might mean something, below a word might mean something else. Yeah, let's back up a second here. So Syriac is dialect of Aramaic, mm -hmm. and like Hebrew, it's written essentially as all consonants. Maybe it's a little simplistic because you have mattress lectionis, let's not get into that. But primarily it's written as a series of um, uh, consonants, it's, uh, Hebrew's 22 consonants, I believe Syriac is as well, Arabic has more consonants. Um, and so if you have two, uh, three letters, you brought the example of uh, Samach Peresh, mm -hmm. which could be Sefer, Safar, uh, it could be siper, mm -hmm. it could be supar, it could be lots of different things. 
And so what, if I'm understanding you correctly, in the Syriac, and I read your article too, I'm cheating here, <laughs> uh, when they wanted to distinguish between two words with, this, with uh, the same consonants, they would put a dot to indicate which of those words it is, right? Right. Okay. And they decided to place the dot either above or below okay. one of these words, and we call them homographs, so homograph meaning same written, so written the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and a dot above a word indicated that this was the homograph with the vowels pronounced farthest back in the mouth, so o, a, mm -hmm. o. Um, and then a dot below indicates a homograph with vowels pronounced farther forward in the mouth, so a, e. Okay. And so that's how Syriac scribes um, tended to designate um, with a diacritic dot above or below. Yeah, and one of the fascinating things you brought is those terms of above and below, which are not intuitive, they're not obvious, at least to me, that there are Jewish sources that use those same exact terms, apparently with a similar meaning. And that that's, that yeah. shows a connection. Yeah, um, we cool. can talk about that, but it, it does get pretty technical. We don't want to get too technical okay. here. Let's talk about this issue, because you talked about... Um, uh, authoritative, and th there's this debate uh, that goes back about um, 500 years about the origin, and this is within Jewish sources even, about how far back the um, the vowels go in graphic form. Mm -hmm. And there were some rabbis, um, even in the 19th, and certainly, I mean, there's modern rabbis, of course, but, but there were very intelligent, learned rabbis in the 19th century who said, no, I don't care what anybody says, the vowels go back to Moses on Mount Sinai. And there were others who say, well, no, they only go back to the, the Masoretes to the 6th or the 7th century or something like that. Right? It's, uh, uh, it's the debate that goes back to um, Eliyahu Bahur, who was the guy who uh, d essentially who edited what became the great rabbinical Bible. Um, so from your perspective, it's not even a possibility they go back to Moses on Mount Sinai. To, what, what would be the strongest evidence that they don't go back before, let's say the year 600, right? Let's, let's throw out a number there, you know. Oh, well, there's no vowel points in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. That's that's a major thing. Um, there are also medieval texts that medieval scholars say they go back to Ezra. Um, yeah. that was There's the some that's in the like in the Kabbalah that say they go back to Adam. Right? Well, that's, 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 that's like the hyperbole, stretch, right? yeah. the exaggeration, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So up to 600, well, you know as well as I do, there there are there's not a ton of Hebrew manuscripts from you know, the, the first few centuries after um, the beginning of the Christian era. So, uh, the Israel Museum calls it the Great Silent Period. Yeah. Right. So you've got the Dead Sea Scrolls that end in 135, and then, then you have the Ashkar Gilson Scroll, which is kind of a, an anomaly, and then the next ones you have are let's call it 800, you know, yeah. give or take 100 years, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think the best way to approach this, because there's such a lack of evidence yeah. for Hebrew, yeah. is to look at what was happening in the whole region in okay. you know, the sixth and seventh centuries. And that is the coming of Islam and the spread of Arabic as sort of the mm -hmm. dominant linguistic force. So when this was happening in Arabic and the Quran, in Syriac and the Syriac Bible, so the Christian Bible, and then Hebrew in the uh, Jewish Bible, these were all unvocalized. So they did not have the vowels. They only had the consonants written. Um, but as these different languages and language groups and different religions start mixing, uh, it becomes more and more important to record exactly what it was because if you're no longer speaking Syriac day to day, if you're a Christian and you start speaking Arabic instead, okay. you may not be able to pronounce the Bible and then your kids may not learn the Bible exactly as you had learned it and then the mm -hmm. tradition starts to be, some people would say, corrupted. Um, mm -hmm. So it became important for Muslims, Christians, and Jews to figure out how to vocalize and put vowels into mm -hmm. their written texts. Um, and they did this all at the same time. So we see it happen in Syriac, where they get this diacritic dot that I talked about, mm -hmm. evolves into full vowel signs, similar to what we have in Hebrew, although they're not the same. Mm -hmm. um, but they have their own set of dots that represent vowels. At the same time, around the 7th century and early 8th mm -hmm. century, Arabic scribes introduced dots into Arabic, and these mm -hmm. dots represent vowels for the first time ever. Presumably, Hebrew scholars would have been doing the same thing at the same time. So okay. I would say late 7th, probably 8th century would be when I would be sure that someone somewhere is putting dots in a Hebrew text. Okay. And from what I understand, the main crux of the debate, let's say 500 years ago, uh, and even to some extent in the 20th century, was over the Zohar. So the Zohar explicitly mentions the vowels uh, and the accents, uh, but certainly repeatedly mentions the vowel signs. And when Rabbis believe the Zohar had been written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the second century. Mm -hmm. Well, then at least it was there in the second century. And then they realized, wait a minute, the Zohar 
is um, a pseudepigraphal book. has nothing to do with Shimon Bar Yochai. It was probably written in the 13th century, maybe with earlier sources from the 11th century. Mm -hmm. And therefore, okay, it was written at a time when you had the full-blown Tiberian system. So when the Zohar mentions a Chirik, it's because Chirik had been around in a graphic form for um, you know, hundreds of years yeah. at that point, right? Um, in the entire Talmud, uh, there is no, ex never mentions a Chirik, never mentions a Patach, never mentions a Kamatz, right? So we have this vast corpus of tens of thousands of pages, I don't know the exact number of pages, and it never once mentions vowels by name. It mentions pisukea tamim, and that's a whole separate discussion of what that is. Um, and they knew about the vowels, right? In other words, there's this, these debates, uh, or not just debates, it's a method of interpretation where they say, read the word this way and not that way. And it's a change of vowels. But there's no evidence from the Talmud that there were graphic symbols to represent those vowels. Right. Exactly. So, so that's something, so, so the Masoretes didn't, to summarize essentially what you're saying, uh, and, and correct me if this is not your position, the masters didn't invent the vowel system, they invented a series of graphic symbols to represent the vowels. Is that fair? That, that is probably the easiest way to say it. Is that, is that the mainstream scholarly view? That's, that's one of my questions. Um, it depends on which stream of scholarship. Okay. Um, in this, you know, in Masoretic studies, yeah, it's, it's fairly accepted that the Tiberians invented a system of points to mm -hmm. record a tradition that was older than them. Okay, what are some other views within scholarship? Uh, well, you can say that the Tiberians invented the vowels as their own way of interpreting the text, and it is, in fact, mm -hmm. not derived from an earlier tradition. Okay. Um, but I think there are too many connections between uh, things that we can glean from Greek translations of Hebrew in the Second Temple period and uh, Greek transcriptions of Hebrew, connections between that and then the medieval Tiberian tradition okay. that suggests that they were not just some, inventing something on the fly. Okay, well, that, that's actually really important. So what would be some sources of those Greek transcriptions that you're talking about? Well, there, there's, of course, the Septuagint, which... Recorded. Let's assume my audience doesn't know what the Septuagint right. is. So it's the early 1st century B.C.? I don't know exactly when. Um, but the... Uh, well, so the original Septuagint is dated to 250 B.C., okay. uh, the time of one of the Ptolemaic kings. He was establishing, according to the legend, the Library at Alexandria. But that was only the five books of Moses. Later, other books were translated. Right. Uh, Esther is probably the latest one because it has a colophon that, I forget the date, but sometime around yeah. 125 BC, let's call it, something like that. So sometime between 250 and 125, of course, we don't have that document. We have something from 300 AD in Codex Vaticanus and Indicus and Alexandrinus. So, but it preserves, and then it had been updated throughout over the centuries. That's another problem that we have. Yeah. Um, but we have fragments in the Dead Sea Scrolls that really are, um, you know, Second Temple period. So we have these Greek transcriptions. And in one of the lectures today, they talked about Greek transcriptions, not just from the Septuagint, but from other sources, right. which I found fascinating. The Secunda, for example, yeah. um, which is uh, from origin in the second century uh, CE or AD. Um, and then we have these um, uh, inscriptions that have transcriptions of words, especially names. Right. right. So from some of those sources, you can tell the, um, the date, uh, or you have connections, you say, rather, to the, uh, um, the, the Tiberian vowel system and the Tiberian pronunciation. Right, say. so you can see the way certain things were <clears throat> pronounced however long ago when those Greek transcriptions of mm -hmm. Hebrew were made, assuming, mm -hmm. and this is the catch, assuming you knew yeah. how Greek was pronounced then. That is an interesting um, question. Yeah, and yeah. Ben Cantor has worked on that quite a bit. He gave uh -huh. a lecture just earlier today. Yeah. Um, so you can use those to find some connections between, uh, you know, especially names, because they're transcribed in Greek a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to translated, they're transcribed from the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. um, and also other ways you can find connections between the Tiberian tradition and earlier traditions is comparing earlier biblical books and later biblical books. Um, Talk about that. Well, this is not my field of expertise. Fair enough, but, yeah. but, but in Aaron general. Aaron Horncall has yeah. done this, he was here today as well, mm -hmm. um, where you can look at the way that the Tiberians decided to vocalize um, like nephal versus internal passives, um, and that can tell you um, what things were written first or what things were written before, and if they're related to uh, Dead Sea Scrolls based on how the Dead Sea Scrolls wow. are recorded. 
Um, but it, it gets very technical, and I don't always follow it, I'll be honest. Okay. So there's actually distinctions between the, the way they vocalize things, which means they weren't just making it up on the fly, as you say. Uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Kahn, who is your um, PhD supervisor, he remarked to me once, he said it's ridiculous that, they were, that the Tiberians would just sat down and, and made up vowels for words, that yeah. they were recording these pre-existent traditions, and I think he says in his book they go back to Second Temple times. Um, tell us more about your book. Let's end with that. Because I want people to go and buy this guy's book. This is fascinating stuff. You know, I, I mean, what, you know what I love about this? This is the type of thing that up until now you had to study Arabic, Judeo-Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, and then dialects of Aramaic, Syriac. And you're putting this in a book where somebody, at least with some background, I don't know if it's written for the layman, but with some kind of background, they can read this and get an idea of, okay, here is the connections between these languages and their vowel systems and, and how they describe the vowel systems. I think that's very important. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, the first thing is you don't have to buy it. Uh, it's open access, and you can download it for free from the Open Book Publishers website. That's the publisher, uh, mm -hmm. Open Book Publishers and the University of Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, so you can download it for free. You can also buy it if you want, but I don't get that money. So, um, And then... The idea in this book, or at least what I tried to do, was write it for a way that someone who is familiar with one Semitic language, okay. know, Hebrew or Syriac or Arabic, can understand what's going on. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's what I tried to do. Okay. Um, and the book is divided into like three main sections. The first mm -hmm. one is about how did medieval scholars talk about vowels? What did they think a vowel was in, com com in comparison to a consonant? Mm -hmm. They were not written originally for them, so they were somehow categorically distinct. So this first section talks about all the different ways that Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic scholars uh, designated what is a vowel compared to a consonant and how they were similar between traditions, um, including the Masoretes. Mm -hmm. The second part is about what I call relative vocalization. So it's this idea of homographs, words that are written the same way, and then there are ways to distinguish what the vowel should be, but we're mm. not quite recording the vowels yet. So they're always interpreted relative to other words. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. And then after that is what I call absolute vocalization. So when we have all the signs mm -hmm. and we can record each vowel with one sign, mm -hmm. um, and that is also when we start to see the names of the vowels really solidify. So the mm -hmm. third part of the book is really about the names of the vowels in Arabic, Syriac, and Hebrew. Um, wow, that's fascinating. The book is called Points of Contact, the Shared Intellectual History of Vocalization in Syriac, Arabic, and Hebrew. Wow. What is the next project you're working on? Can you share that with us? You've, you got your PhD recently. Yep. Um, what, what, is, what do you have? For, I'm excited. What's in the future? Um, if, if you can share, maybe it's a secret. In which well, case, we'll edit no, this out. No, it's not necessarily a secret. Okay. I'm working on a couple of things right now. Yeah. Um, part of my ongoing research is more about medieval linguistics and trying mm -hmm. to understand um, especially some of the unpublished Masoretic texts that are still in mm. the Cairo Geniza. So I'm looking at those and also some unpublished Syriac linguistic texts. Um, the other thing that I'm working on right now is um, looking at printed man or not man printed books in the Cairo Geniza, uh, hmm. Hebrew books that were printed in Europe and then came to Cairo. Wow! Um, trying to figure out why they're there, how they got there, and what that means for the Geniza society. Wow! So, those are the things I'm working on right now. Fascinating, Nick. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks. Uh, and I wish you uh, success and uh, um, continue your studies and and. Um, you know, beyond your doctorate and it's fascinating stuff. And I'm looking forward to reading your studies. Thank you very much. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's McCore Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.